Hello everyone. After class on Friday, I was thinking about this case we talked about with the crickets in Hawaii, and I wanted to just uh, repeat the main points of that case in this in this video uh, because I realized that sometimes with the students who are attending remotely and the students who are attending in class, sometimes that communication can be a little difficult. And in this particular case, when you were kind of required to be in both places at the same time, your small groups plus the larger groups, I think it made it difficult to get the main points from this case. So I, so I just want to take a few minutes and go over this again so you have the main points from this case as you prepare for the exam. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over this case. And if you recall, this case involved crickets found on the island of Kauai. In the 1980s, the male crickets of this species could be found chirping all night long. And they chirp to attract females. And the females do not chirp. And the first question we had was, what is it called when males and females differ in a trait? If you want, you can hit pause and come up with the answer on your own and hit play again. Um, but I'm going to reveal the answer here in just one second. The correct answer is sexual dimorphism. This is when males and females have some difference in the way they appear. Usually, but not always, but usually it's the male that has either some kind of um, bright color or um, makes a certain noise like we see in these crickets. Then as we described on Friday, in the 1990s, a parasitic fly arrived on the island. And so this would be a classic case of an invasive species. This fly preyed upon the crickets. This particular parasitic fly would lay its eggs on the back of the crickets, shown here. The fly larvae then burrow into the cricket where they develop, and the larvae use that source of the cricket for food. And thus the male cricket dies. I, I said male cricket, but really these parasitic flies could lay their eggs on any cricket. It's just that the crickets that made noise were easy targets for this fly. About 10 years after they arrived, the island was virtually silent of crickets. And so the question I asked you, had the crickets been wiped out? And we had a, a discussion about this and, and we came up with the conclusion that no, the, the crickets had not been wiped out. In fact, when researchers started studying the island, they still found large populations of crickets. But the male crickets they found were silent. They could not chirp. So then one wonders what determines this trait, any trait. But now we're talking about the trait of chirping versus non-chirping. And remember, we talked about how if these are our two chromosomes or one set of, of chromosomes, there would be a gene on these chromosomes. And each of these genes would be a particular allele. And one could easily make a prediction that these genes are going to make a protein that provides some ability to chirp. There's some heritable factor that allows them to chirp. And as long as there's no mutations, the cricket would chirp. If there's mutations in them, it might alter the chirping. It might make it non-chirping, less chirping, even more and louder chirping. And then we discussed a little bit this question here, and it's an interesting question. Can a male cricket choose not to chirp? And someone in class said that they thought they could because when they walk in a room, the crickets stop chirping. And that's a really great observation. And so at some level, they can decide to chirp or not chirp. But in general, when we think about this behavior, when they're trying to attract a mate, they're chirping. They wouldn't necessarily see a fly and say, oh, that fly's out here to kill me and stop chirping. And so what they discovered that this gene here that we hypothesized about actually coded for a protein that made this structure here along the wing. And this structure here helps the cricket chirp. And when I say chirp, they rub their wings in a certain pattern to, to generate that chirping sound. But when this structure isn't present because of a mutation in those genes, you can see it here, it's not as rigid. The cricket is silent. It can no longer chirp. And so that's what happened. The flies would come along here, this male would chirp, and they would go after this male. They didn't necessarily have a preference for that male. It was just an easy target. This male here didn't know how lucky he had it, right? Because the, the parasitic flies just didn't see it and it survived. So then these next two questions are pretty important for us to think about. And let's talk about this first question here. What evolutionary mechanism produced the new allele that changed the wing structure so the cricket could chirp? And remember, of all the mechanisms of evolution, the only one that generates new alleles is mutation. 
remember, we had a, a chromosome here with a gene in it, and this gene generated a mutation. The mutation happened at some point, long before it saw the fly, and so this mutation was random. But it generated diversity in that population, because now you had crickets that could not chirp. This here question is an incredibly important question, because it's one of the major misconceptions that people have about evolution. Did the presence of the parasitic fly somehow cause the origin of the new allele? So it's important to, to remember that if we have a population here of flies, I'm just going to draw a whole bunch of circles here, that within this population, you're going to have a diverse set of phenotypes, not just for chirping or not chirping, but all the other different traits that a cricket might have. You're going to have diversity in that population. And so, but let's just talk about chirping. There is a competitive advantage to chirp, right? Because you attract the female cricket. So one would predict that most of the crickets here would have the ability to chirp. And I'm just going to put a check mark by the ones that I'm saying can chirp. All of these can chirp. Most of them can chirp because there's an incredible selective advantage to being able to chirp. However, maybe we had a couple crickets that couldn't chirp because for whatever reason, they gained this mutation randomly. And these crickets that couldn't chirp, they had a much less probability to be able to reproduce, but every now and then they could reproduce. They made these mutations, again, randomly, before they ever saw the fly. And in class, I made a point, and we'll come back to this on Monday when we talk about Hardy Weinberg, but it's really important that we have large populations. Because if you have a large population, that means that you have a greater chance of having a diverse set of alleles that will allow that population to grow and to survive. Because it can take advantage of that genetic toolkit it has within that population. And we'll come back to this in a moment, but you, one might say then that within this population, the distribution of crickets might look something like this, where we have the number of crickets here, and down here we have the chirping trait. I'm just gonna put CH for chirping. Here, maybe it's really loud. These crickets down here, they have a very loud chirping. And maybe that's not very good, because maybe if you chirp really loud, you might attract other predators, or maybe the female doesn't prefer a very loud chirping cricket. Down here you have crickets that don't chirp. And down here you have crickets in the middle, right here, that have this optimal chirping pattern. And that's what you saw on the island before. But you have this diversity of different degrees of chirping. Now I've already alluded to question three here a little bit as we've been leading up to this point, but let's talk about the four postulates of Darwin and use relevant vocabulary, explain how the non-chirping trait increased in frequency once it appeared. We'll come back to this question in a moment. I would recommend that you hit pause on the video and redo this. Try to do it without looking at your notes. This would be good practice for the exam. And then when you have an answer, go ahead and hit play, and then you'll see what the answer is. Okay, so the first one here is variation. And that means that there is a wide range of variation within a population. Some of the crickets chirp, some of the crickets don't chirp. And even amongst the crickets that chirp, there is likely a variation in the degree, the pitch, and the amount of chirping, just like I drew here in this graph. So lots of variation within that population because it was a large population. Again, if it was a small population, it might have wiped out the crickets because you might not have had the random chance of getting these non-chirping. And then the ability to chirp has to be heritable. That means it has to be on a gene. And remember how we talked about this a couple times here, where we have our chromosomes here, and we have our genes for chirping here. And if there's no mutations on them, you're gonna pass on the genes for, for chirping. If there are mutations on them, you're gonna pass on the genes, or rather I should say alleles, that produce no chirping. All right, so let's talk about this third postulate. The survival and reproductive success of the crickets is highly variable, where some crickets reproduce with much greater success. Remember, with this postulate, we're not quite yet talking about why some survive and some don't. We're just saying that when you have a large population and you produce many offsprings, it's not probable that they're all going to survive. There will be some that just won't survive because the crickets, in this case, are making too many progeny. So it's going to be variable which crickets survive and which crickets don't survive. So let's move on to the fourth postulate. And now this fourth postulate 
gets at this question of why do some of these crickets survive and some don't. So it's important to remember that the crickets that survive is not a random sampling of that population. So if we had, say, 10 crickets here, and obviously the number of crickets was much more, but we don't have time for me to draw a million circles here. If it was random, we might say that this cricket was picked here, this cricket was picked here, and this cricket was picked here, and maybe this cricket here, just completely random. But what we know is that it's not random, that the crickets that survive are those crickets that chirp. So it's not random. It's very selective. It selects those crickets that could chirp. Now, once the parasitic fly arrived, the variation of crickets that survived was different. Those crickets that could not chirp were now the ones that survived. It all has to do with which individuals in that population have an adaptation that is advantageous to survival. Before the flies, the advantageous adaptation was the ability to chirp. After the flies, the advantageous adaptation was not chirping. So let's move to this next question. And this question asks, is this directional, stabilizing, disruptive, or balancing? Let's draw our population as it existed before the flies. And remember we said here, this would represent what we'll call an optimal chirping. So I'm just going to put OPT for optimal and then CH for chirping. So those crickets that had the right pattern of chirping were the ones that survived. Because over here is the number or the percentage, however you wanted to quantify this, of crickets that survived. Over here... I'm going to put a minus sign. That was for no chirping. Over here was, let's just say, lack of a better way of saying it, excessive chirping. Maybe it was too loud. Maybe it was too often. Maybe it was a, the wrong pitch. I'm not sure what it is. And in between these, so between no chirping and optimal chirping, there was variation that led to the optimal chirping and also variation here. But then when we added those pesty little flies, we saw more crickets that could not chirp. And so the distribution changed. It went from something like we had over here on the left to something that looked more like this, where we had more of those non-chirpers. We had fewer of those optimal chirping. And over here, we had the excessive chirpers. I'm going to put two pluses here to indicate excessive chirping. So this is a classic example of directional selection. It would be disruptive Let's just, as, as a review, and if you want to go ahead and hit pause and write down what you think a, an example of disruptive selection would look like and then an example of what stabilizing would look like. So disruptive, it would have a pattern like this. Where for whatever reason, we just got rid of the optimal chirpers or most of the optimal chirpers and we stayed with two populations of non-chirping and of excessive chirping. This would be disruptive. And over time, many, many generations, these two groups may develop into new species. So this is a classic way that new species are formed. Stabilizing would look something like this, where there is even increased pressure to maintain these optimal chirpers. And we saw fewer and fewer of the extremes of the non-chirping and of the excessive chirping. Let's move on to this question. If this parasitic fly was removed from the island, what do you think would happen to the frequency of the chirping versus non-chirping traits? Let's go back to our drawings over here. So once the parasitic flies were on the island, they would look like this, where we had mainly non-chirpers. You still had some of these others because you're still going to have that variation. But now, if we remove the flies, as I show here with this reverse arrow, it's reasonable to predict that by removing the flies, so no flies, that the population would shift and you would again see more flies with that optimal chirping pattern. Because the female flies would still have a preference for the chirping because they're easier to find. So this would probably be the best explanation. Now, on an exam, if you had a question like this, as I explained in class, you could come up with an alternative explanation and say, maybe when we remove the flies, 
There's also had been, over this period of time, a selection that happened with the female crickets. Maybe those female crickets that survived preferred the non-chirpers. And so you could make an argument that it's going to stay just like we see here. But you would want to be able to explain both of them. It would be really hard to kind of explain how it would become a disruptive selection pattern. So I, I don't know if I would go there. You're always welcome to try, but I want you to get points. So I would go with one of those first two I described. So we didn't answer this question in class because we ran out of time, but let's go ahead and answer it now. What is it called when males compete in this way for meat for females? And the two choices are going to be intersexual and intrasexual. So remember, when we have two males competing, the chirping versus the non-chirping crickets, that's happening within the group of males. It's similar to two elephant seals, as we talked about in an earlier podcast, how those two elephant seals vigorously fight for the optimal place on the beach to attract mates. So within, when it's within the same sex as in males here, we call that intrasexual. So I'm going to draw a line from intrasexual up to this question here. Okay, and then intersexual, let's draw an arrow down here because that's what we're going to talk about with this question below here. What is it called when females select mates based on a trait that signals their good alleles? Signals an honest trait. And so this is intersexual because it is the female, in this case, being choosy about which male to mate with. So inter means between, and so it's intersexual means it's some level of competition between females and which male she's going to choose. In class, somebody asked a really good question about whether or not before and after the flies were introduced, the population, was that changing this population from an intersexual to an intersexual scenario or vice versa? And the answer is neither because both exist. Intersexual and intrasexual selection exists before the parasitic flies arrive and after the parasitic flies arrive. So before and after the flies arrive, the males are competing, chirping versus non-chirping. And so that's intrasexual. So that competition existed before and after. The thing that changes is who wins. Now, intersexual also exists before and after. The female is still choosy. She would still choose a cricket that chirps, but she just doesn't find as many of them now. And so for lack of a better way of saying it, she settles for the crickets that do not chirp. But that intersexual selection is still there. It's just she can't always choose the one she wants. Life is tough being a cricket. You don't always get exactly what you want, I guess. So what are the two competing selection pressures at work in this population of crickets? Well, there are two competing ones. You might be able to think of others. But the first is chirping or no chirping. If a cricket can chirp, it'll attract the females. If it can't, it's less successful at attracting females. So that's one selection pressure at work here. The second one is the presence or absence of the flies. So I'm just going to put plus minus and then flies. And I think this cartoon here shows it pretty simply. On the left here is one of those selection pressures. Presence or absence of flies. And up here is chirping or no chirping. If the flies are absent, the females are going to choose the chirping male crickets. And they're not going to choose the non-chirping one. Every now and then they will, but usually they choose the chirping one. However, if the flies are present, the parasitic flies are present, they can more easily identify and find the chirping crickets. And when there are no chirping crickets left, or very few of them, the numbers of non-chirping crickets increases in that population. And so now the female will mate with the non-chirping cricket. That pesty little fly is still here. It just can't see the one here. Okay, that's it for this case. Um, I hope this um, made it more clear. And if you were attending class remotely, I'm certain this helped fill in some of the gaps that you might have missed because you were in between the team channel and the big channel. All right, that's all. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. And if not, I will see you in class. Bye.